We bless the Lord. We are glad to be here again in the house of the Lord. We are continuing in our verse by verse study of the book of Romans. All right. We are in the book of Romans. Praise the Lord. We are continuing our verse by verse study of the book of Romans, and today we are going to pick up in Romans chapter 7 for a while. Romans chapter 7. We bow our heads and pray. Eternal Father, we are grateful to you for allowing us to be here. Father, we sing thanks to you. We sing thanksgiving and praise to you, Lord, because you are our Father, our Creator, our Designer. We are forever grateful to you, Lord for keeping us in a sound frame of mind, even in this time that we are living in. All the honor, all the glory, all the praise belongs to you. Even as we open up the text of Scripture today, Lord, God, we pray that your presence will be with us. Illumination will come. Our eyes and our ears will be open. You will speak to us even as I stand. I sit before your people today to minister your words. Lord, I pray for the skills and the ability the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding to rightly divide the Word of God before your people. Bless us and be glorified, be magnified as we open up the text today. We ask these favors in the blessed anointed name of Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Bless the Lord. So we are picking up from where we left off. We got to go to chapter 7 of Romans. Romans chapter 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law had dominion over a man as long as he lives. Now, we have to kind of go back to chapter 6 and look at what Paul said in chapter 6 and verse 14, where he said, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. For what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Now Paul made this statement in uh, chapter 6, 14 and 15. And Paul, he knew, because he, Paul, Paul he, he, he knew the human condition. And Paul was a theologian, he was a philosopher, and he knew how the human, human beings would think. So he knew that people will have questions. When he put all of these things that he's saying to us from chapter 1 to chapter 6 here, he realized that they're going to be questioned. And that's the reason why, as he continued to write the letter, because you remember he was writing a letter. He's writing a letter to the God-fearing community in Rome. And he's expecting them to have questions. So he is providing the question because the letter is still in his hand. The letter don't meet, reach Rome as yet. Paul still writing the letter. But he's just thinking the question that these people are going to have. And he's providing the, the question and he's also supplying the answers. So, you know, he, he's thinking about what they're going to say when he made the statement and he told them that they are not under the law, but they are under grace. And therefore, he, he, he said in uh, verse 1 of chapter 7, Know ye not brethren. So he's talking to brethren. He's talking to, I guess, the God-fearing community. For I speak to them that know the law. People who know the law. And we have to understand that during the time of Yeshua, during the time of the early church, the early church did not put away the law. They did not put the law or the commandments from the Old Testament. When we talk about the commandments of the Old Testament, uh, most of us probably only know about Ten Commandments. But they are, according to what the, the people who study these things are telling us, there are 613 commandments in the Old Testament. So, you know, we, we, don't, we don't really put them away. And sometimes we have, we have to be very careful. When we start saying, and we're looking at the text, and we say, well, we are no more under the law, we are under grace. That doesn't mean that we are free to go out and break God's commandment. Because we have to understand there are different types of commandments in the Old Testament. For instance, when you talk about the commandment, I just mentioned that 
there is you know approximately 613 commandments in the Old Testament and you know they're, they're what we call moral laws the moral laws of God we can't put them away we can't say that we are not under them anymore and when we talk about the moral laws of God you're talking about where God said thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not kill thou shalt not steal honor your father and your mother don't bear false witness against your neighbor don't covet your neighbor's wife and things like that those laws they are eternal they can't pass away and once humanity keep on living these laws are going to exist so we we in the, in the christian community i know we are big on saying that we are not under the law we are under grace that does not mean that we are free from the moral laws of god when you talk about these ceremonial laws, I just said that there are different laws in the Old Testament. It has the ceremonial laws, and the ceremonial laws is those laws that deals with ceremony. For instance, you know, different types of offering, the way how you have to present the offering. You know, it has the dietary laws, and all of these laws, you know, um, you know, moon, and you know, different set of uh, uh, types of way that you have to make your offering you have to do different washing uh, washing your hands and washing your feet and all of these laws i will say that we in this time we don't have to um uh carry out these laws these laws against uh, you know as we say in, in in the christian community they are being fulfilled in yeshua but the moral laws of god they are there and we have to abide by them so we, we, when we say we are not under the law, we are under grace, we have to be careful how we, we make these statements. We have to abide by the moral laws of God. We have to respect what the moral laws of God said. And how about keeping the Sabbath? How about keeping the Sabbath? How about worshiping on Saturday? You know, most of us in our community, in the Christian community, we don't understand that worshiping on Sunday is very new. Sunday worship is not old. During the time of Yeshua, when Yeshua was here, no, Yeshua the Messiah did not worship on Sunday. It was uh, the sixth day was the day of worship. Sunday, it was a regular day of work. And it is Constantine, Emperor Constantine, who changed, according to what I'm studying, what I'm reading, it is Emperor Constantine who changed uh, the worship from Saturday, from the fourth, the, 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 the sixth day to the fourth day of the week. He changed it, I think it's in 321 AD. This is about, you know, uh, 300, 200 and almost 300 years after the death of Christ, Constantine came along and he changed the worshiping from Saturday, the sixth day to Sunday, the fourth day of the week. But before that, people used to worship on Saturday. And it's like, you know, acknowledging Jesus as God. Who you think um, gave that, uh, uh, that, that order? Constantine, he, he also played a major role in people worshiping Jesus as God. Constantine is a man, that's what I'm saying. When we, when we are doing discussion, on whether or not Jesus is God or Jesus was a man anointed by God. It is hard for us to make contribution towards this unless we really do a study of how Jesus became God. And when you do a study of how Jesus became God, you will see in 325 AD when these bishops, I guess it was Roman Catholic bishops, they gather together in Nicaea and they have a council. Well, before that, they have different discussions that was going on and they did not, they wasn't able to come to any agreement whether or not if Jesus was a man or if he was God. So uh, Constantine, who was the ruler of the whole Roman Empire, he got a hold of that and he came into that, he, 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 he got them to have that meeting in Nicaea 325 AD and Emperor Constantine was there. And it is Emperor Constantine who came up with the, the idea that Jesus is made from the same substance as God the Father. 
Uh, I think in the in, in the Greek, yeah, it's homoousios, and it means that uh, Jesus and God is from the same substance. Whatever made Jesus God is the same thing that made God the Father God. So it's Constantine who really changed that. But before that, during the time of the Messiah, during his early ministry, people did not recognize him. People did not call him God. People saw him as the Messiah. In the book of uh, Matthew chapter 16, um, he asked the disciples, Whom do men say that I am? And they said, Some say that you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he asked them, he said, Who do you say that I am? Peter said to him, Thou art the Christ. The word Christ don't mean God. Christ means anointed one. It's just like the, the prophets and the priests and all of these kings in the Old Testament. Even some, uh, I think, the children of God, some of God's, uh, you know, Israelite people used to be recognized as anointed one. God anoint Jesus of Nazareth, Acts 10, 38, tell us, with the, with the Holy Ghost and power. If the anointing of God on the life of Yeshua the Messiah, that is why he's called Christ. He is the Christ. That is, his, that is not his name. That is not his last name. Christ is not his last name. His name is Yeshua, the Messiah, and the Messiah means anointed one. So what I'm saying is that is Emperor Constantine who changed the worship from the sixth day of the week to the fourth day of the week. Before that, the people was worshiping on the sixth day of the week, but he decided that he's going to make Sunday a day of rest. And the thing is, he made it a day of rest, not to God and but to the Son, S-U-N. That's why they call it Sunday. It's a day of rest to the Son. We don't even know if it's directed to God. He, when Constantine changed it, it wasn't because they wanted to worship the Creator God that we are serving today. They were, they were talking about worshiping the sun. And that is the reason why they call it Sunday. And what I'm saying is that Constantine changed the worship from the sixth day to the fourth day of the week. And he is the man that changed, um, uh, made Jesus or solidified. He's the one that came up with the idea that Jesus and God is from the same substance. And from that time, you know, they put it into law that you have to acknowledge Jesus as God. Back in that time, after 325 AD, anybody who don't acknowledge Jesus as God was considered to be a heretic. And you know what they used to do to those people? They used to burn them. They used to run them out of town and, and, and kill them, you know, if they don't want to recant their, their story. So what the text is telling us here, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law had dominion over man as long as he lived. So what he's saying here, laws. Whether you're talking about the laws of God, talking about the commandment, those 613 commandments, or you're talking about uh, physical laws, laws of the land, it had dominion over a person while that person is alive. But once that person died, Laws of the land don't have dominion over a dead person. Laws don't speak or minister to a dead person. Although I was reading last week where in Canada here, when you die, you know, the government will, will still tax you in. Even after you die, if you, have, if you have property, if you have a house, or you have, you know, investment. For instance, my wife and I, uh, you know, in a relationship, and I passed away. Uh, what they will do, they will roll whatever property uh, or investment that I have, roll it over to my wife. But when she passed away, she had to pay taxes on all of that investment, the property, the whatever, RSP, whatever investment you have. When you die, you have to pay um, taxes on it. So, you know, the, the law, in a sense, is still applied to a dead person where taxes is concerned. But where the physical laws is concerned, what Paul is saying here, while a person is alive, the law applies. But when a person is dead, the law does not apply to them. And he's, he's using this analogy here so he can bring out um, a truth, a biblical truth. So he, he says um, in verse 2, 
For the woman which had a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lived. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So what he's doing here, he's using the husband and wife relationship, the married relationship. He's using it as an example to bring out the truth concerning, there's a truth that you want to apply here, but he's using marriage as an analogy. And he's saying, for the woman which had a husband is bound by the law to her husband, the marriage law, bound a woman to her husband for life. When a woman married to a man, that woman is bound to her husband for life. This does not apply to the man. And you know when I look at, you know, what the text is telling us here. Back in Bible time, women didn't have rights to divorce their husband. A woman couldn't divorce their husband. Is 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 lately, you know, society changed laws, and a woman could um, initiate a divorce. But before. It was the man who initiated divorce. And I'm asking myself the question, is it God that made his law? You think God, a just God, and a righteous God, he will initiate something, put something in force, and it is more lenient on the side of a man. A man could do something, but a woman can't do it. Now, when you go into the book of Deuteronomy chapter 24, you will see where the text tells us that when a man married a woman, when a man married a woman, if he find no favor in her, he found some kind of an uncleanness in her, this man is able to sit down or stand up, write, get a piece of paper, or go to the elders of the community who could write, but most people back in that time could not write. So he have to, if he don't find no favor in that woman, if he finds some kind of an uncleanness in that woman, whether it's, uh, you know, she can't cook or she can't wash, you know, she, maybe she can't make children or something like that, something that, you know, he doesn't find favor in, all he needs to do is to go to the elders of the city and get them to write a, a bill or a paper of divorcement and put it in that woman's hand. And then he, he, he you know, she has to leave. He, you know, he asked her to leave and she's on her own. But the woman could not do that. The woman, there's no way a woman could have divorced um, the husband. It was only the husband who can divorce uh, the wife. I think it's maybe kind of recently in Islam, they start changing the law so that women could initiate divorce. But before, it was the man who was able to initiate the divorce. So. What you can see in the text here, what he's showing us, uh, for the woman which had a husband is bound by the law to her, to her husband so long as he lives. So while the husband is alive, the wife is bound to him by the marriage law. She can't get out of the marriage. The, the, it, this is not the same for the man. The man can get out of the marriage if he chose to, but the woman could not get out. But if the husband be dead. She is loose from the law of her husband. You know, this, this does not apply to the man. It only applies to the woman. And it tells us so that if while her husband lives, she is married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband is dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she is married to another man. So if she get out of the marriage, if she try to marry to another person while her husband is alive, she will be called an adulteress. Adulteress. If, if the same thing happened to the man, nobody not going to point finger at him and call him, you know, an adulterer. An adulterer. You know, no, he's able to have more than one wife. But this is not the case with the woman. And when I look at uh, different commentaries, you see that Commentators, Christian commentators not, don't talk about these things. They don't talk about the unjustness or the unfairness that is written in these, these texts. And that's the reason why I'm saying there are some things in the Bible that we have to question ourselves and ask whether or not it is God that put it in there. 
or if it's man who put that in there. Do you know it's men that wrote the Bible? A lot of us think that the Bible was written in heaven and God just give an angel to bring down or he drop him down from heaven and the Bible came down to us. That is not how the Bible was given. There is a, a, a human side to the writing of the Bible. Yes, we believe that God inspired men. But we have to have common sense enough and have wisdom enough to know that there are some things that we see in the Bible. When we see it, we have to question it. And, and, and God is not unfair. And when I look at what the text is saying here, this is very unfair in the sense that a man can divorce his wife, but a woman can't divorce her husband. She has to wait until he dies. So how about when you know, a woman is in an abusive situation? How, how is she going to get out of that relationship? She can't get out. She can't get out unless the man dies. So what, what, what that is saying? She has to kill him. Because if, if, if she can't get freedom from him, unless he dies, and he continues to live, and she's in an abusive uh, relationship, she has to stick it out. That is what the text is telling us. But that's what I'm saying. I, I really believe that some of these texts that we are seeing here, some of these things that we are seeing here, the men, the men who wrote these texts, they put it in there so that they can have some leverage over their, their wife. And God is a just God. God is a God is a God of justice. And when you look at this, there's no justice in this. You know? So I, I'm glad that, you know, people's eyes are open, leaders' eyes are open. Uh, in different community, in the Muslim community, the eyes of these people are open and they see well they have to make things right. They can't just, you know, allow men to divorce their wife and a woman can't initiate divorce. They make it make the playing field level, the playing field supposed to be level. In God's eyes, the, in the text tells us that there is no male or female, Jew or Gentile, we are all one in the Lord, and the playing field is supposed to be equal. Praise the name of the Lord. But Paul is not really talking here about marriage and divorce. What he's doing is using a marriage to bring out a point. It's an illustration that he's making. In verse 4, he said, Therefore, my brethren, ye are, ye, you also have become dead to the law by the body of the Messiah. So what he's saying is, he's applying this to us. He said, we become dead. You remember what the point he's trying to bring here is that the woman can't marry unless the husband is dead. Somebody had to be had to be had to die before uh, another marriage can take place. He's going to show us that another marriage is going to take place here. The believer is going to marry to Christ, but somebody had to die. But it's not the law. It, you, you notice he didn't say that the law died. The law did not die. Therefore, my brethren, ye also have become dead to the law. We are dead to the law by the body of the Messiah. And as we study in chapter 6, it tells us that when we were baptized, when we become born again, when we become converted and we are baptized, it said we are buried with Christ by baptism. And when we come up from the water, we are risen with him by his resurrection. So our, our baptism with Christ, it represents death. And, 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 and this is the point that Paul is trying to bring out here. That he should be married to another. So what he's saying here, we are married to Christ. We are in a relationship with Christ. We are in unity with Christ because of our conversion, because we become born again, and because we are baptized and we are risen with Him, we are in a relationship with Him. And we have to understand that this is not talking about some kind of um, physical, sexual relationship. Because I know some, some people will use this to say, well, I'm married to Christ. You know, there are some women out there who have husbands, and they deny uh, their husband, deny their husband their body because they think that they're married to Christ. And they think that, you know, because this is in the text, Jesus is your husband. Jesus is not your husband. If you have a wife, if you have a husband, Jesus is not your husband. If you have, <laughs> if you have a wife, Jesus is not your wife. Now, if you're single, 
If you're a single woman and you want to say that Jesus is your husband, fine. But if you if you have a husband, you can deny your husband whatever privilege or rights he should have towards your body and say, well, Jesus is your husband. This is not what the text is saying here. What he's saying here, when we become born again and we are baptized and we are risen up from the water, we are, we, we, it represents our death and burial and resurrection with the assured Messiah. This is what he's trying to communicate to us. He said, even to him who is risen from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So when we, when, when we, when we become born again, and our life is changed, you know, when we are, we, when we are in uh, the Messiah or in God, our life is changed. God expects us to bring forth fruit. Our life is supposed to be different. The fruits that produce from our life are supposed to be different. And Yeshua Messiah said, I, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. We have to bring forth fruit. We can't live the same life that we were living before. You know the song that we used to sing? The things I used to do, I do them no more. The places I used to go, I go there no more. There is a great change since I was born. You know, the text of scripture tells us that, you know, you can't take a, old, a, a new piece of garment. You have an old garment that needs to be patched up and you take a, a new piece of cloth and you patch it in with an old garment, what it's going to do is going to rip the whole thing apart. Also, it's said that we can't take, or it's not wise, to take you know, new wine and pour it into old bottle. Back in the day, they used to have, uh, the take, you know, you have wine and you're looking for a bottle, they will get the goat skin, kill an animal, a sheep, a goat, and they will make a bottle from that new skin. And they will put new wine into that uh, skin, wine skin. So when the new wine goes into the skin, it's going to expand. And because the skin is new, it's not going to fall apart. But if you take an old wine skin and you put new wine into it, when the wine starts to expand, it's going to burst the, 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 the wine skin. And it's the same thing applied. We are new. We are new in God, new in Christ, whichever one you want to say. When we become born again, we become new. And the life, the, the life that we used to live before, we can live that same life. Uh, in Roman Galatians, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live it by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We have to live new life. We have to walk in newness of life. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. So what it says in verse 5, for when we were in the flesh, when it talks here about being in the flesh, when we were in the flesh, it means it's talking about the life that we were living before, the sinful life, the lifestyle that we were living before, that is considered to be in the flesh. Even after when we come born again, we are still living in a flesh and blood body. But we, 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 we have a new man, we put on a new man, our heart is circumcised. So in the flesh, it's talking about the life that we were living before we became born again. For when we were in the flesh, the aff aff affliction, affliction of sin, we throw by the law. What he's saying is when we're in the flesh, the affliction of sin. Sin is powerful, you know. Sometimes we underestimate sin. Sin is powerful. When a person lives in sin, they are doing damage to themselves. When you commit sin, you are damaging your body. Sin is detrimental to us. And the text tells us that a person who commits adultery or fornication, when a person commits sexual sin, what they are doing, they are sinning against their own body, you are doing harm to your own body. So sin is very detrimental. It causes uh, pain. That word uh, 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 affliction is talking about pain that comes into a person's body when they commit sin. And he said, which uh, he said the affliction of sin, which were by the law. So what he's saying here, affliction, pain, 
No, and it involved the law. It's not saying that the law caused pain or the law caused affliction because God's law is holy. But what he's saying here, when, the, when we sin, when we sin and the law brings us up to date, the law, because the law is supposed to point out sin. When the law points out sin to us, it causes pain because we know that we are under God's judgment. And we know that we have to be accountable to God. So therefore, it caused pain to come into us. So that is, that is what Paul is saying. He said, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So what he's saying here, when we was in our flesh, you know, in, 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 before we become born again, we used to be involved in all kinds of our corruption, all kinds of filthiness. And these fruits that we were bringing forth, it was unto death. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And we have to understand that sin has a payment. There is a day when all sin will have to be reckoned for. And, and this is what I think that the, the text, you know, is it, trying to point us to in verse 7, but not verse 6, sorry. But now we are delivered from the law. See here again. Paul is saying here we are delivered from the law. We have to be careful that we interpret these things right. Because I know a lot of people in the Christian community, they are saying that we are delivered from the law, so therefore we are not under the law. And people think that this gives them freedom to go out and break God's law. Brethren, we have to keep the law of God. We have to obey the law of God. And you know, I, I, I guess that's the reason why we have so much people especially leaders in the Christian community who think that they are not under God's moral law anymore because they are seeing in the text where the text is telling them that they are free from the law. So some of these men think that they are not under the, uh, the moral laws of God so therefore they can go out and commit adultery. They can go out and steal. That's the reason why we probably have so much of stealing going on in the church. My wife was showing me something about that. We were talking about the, the corruption and all of the skullduggery. That's the truth of that word. All of the, 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 the scheme that's going on in society today was sometime when I was in the bank and the bank manager is telling me on a daily basis there are a lot of people who come into the bank because people is scamming them out of their funds. So my wife was saying to me, she was saying that she think that the idea of, uh, of doing uh, cook retain in society. Maybe people in society pick this up from the church. They are probably seeing the way how uh, church leaders are skimming people. They, 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 are, they, they are committing all of these skullduggery in the church. And maybe it, the, 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 the people in the world probably see what the church is doing. You don't think the, people, the only people looking at, at, at us? They're looking at us. So what, what I'm saying is that we are not delivered from the law in the sense that we don't have to keep the law. So many people in the Christian community, so many leaders in the Christian community, living in adultery, living in fornication, stealing, lying, and all of these kind of things, taking away other people's wives, covetous, you know, uh, being covetous of, of, of things other people have. And I'm asking myself the question, is it because they think that they are not under the law. Brethren, we are still under the moral laws of God. And it means that we're not supposed to commit adultery. We're not supposed to lie. Not even the white one. I know people think, oh, the big black lie, that is the one you're not supposed to tell. Even the little one that we call white lies, we're not supposed to lie. If you give somebody your word and you can't keep it, what are you supposed to do? You have to call that person, you have to meet that person and say, listen man, I, I make a promise to you and I can't fulfill it. Could you let me out from that promise or could you give me an extension so I can fulfill the promise? But you can't just let it go by. If you do that, you will be committing a sin because it's a lie, you give your word. That the text tells us we have to let our, our yes be yes. I will no be no. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. It tells us it was six, but now we are delivered from the law that being dead, wherein we, we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness 
of the latter. So what he say here, we will deliver from the law. Deliverance from the law here means that the penalty. There is judgment. When he talks here about deliverance from the law, he's not saying that you're free to go out and break the law. What he's saying here, the judgment that was hanging over our head because of us breaking the law, we are delivered from that law. We are not breaking the law anymore as born again people. We 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 are living in adultery. We're not lying. We're not stealing. You know, we're not we 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 are doing these things because we come to the light. So therefore, that judgment is not over our head anymore, and that's that's the freedom that the, the Paul is trying to communicate here. Not freedom to go out and break God's law because we think that we are not under them. It's freedom in the sense that there is no judgment that is hanging over our heads. Because we are not breaking the laws of God anymore. We see the light. He said that that brings death. Wherein we were held. So we were held in captivity. Before we acknowledged Christ as our Lord and Savior. We were all in captivity to sin. We were all tied up in captivity. That we should serve in newness of spirit. And not in the oldness of the latter. We have to serve God in newness of spirit. Praise the name of the Lord. We have to put on new garment, the filthy garment. We have to put that away. It's like what the text tells us about the salt, the pig that was washed. You have your pig and, you know, you wash your pig and then as soon as that pig sees some dirty water, it's gone back and messed itself up again. And you talk about the dog. The dog that vomit up, eat and vomit up and go back to that same vomit and eat it. Brethren, if we go back to that old lifestyle, we will be like that pig. We will be like that dog that go back to the vomit. He also tells us that the person who put their hands to the plow and pull it back is not fit for the kingdom of God. When we go, when, when we become born again and we go back and live a sinful lifestyle, what we are doing, we are jeopardizing our chance or our um, entrance into the kingdom of God. We have to be careful, brethren. We have to look at the text and see that the text is very serious. This is serious thing that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. It, it, it tells us in verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? What is that? He's asking the question. Is the law sin? Is the law corrupt? Is God's law unholy? There's nothing sinful about the law. The law of God give, give to us, the Old Testament laws, those uh, 613 commandments. It's holy. It's God's commandment. Anything that God put his hands to, it's holy. So there's nothing wrong with the law. What the problem is, is sin. Sin is the problem. And as I said, sin is very powerful. Excuse me. Sin is very powerful. In James chapter 1, it tells us when sin conceived, it, it, when lust conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. And that's just showing us how powerful sin is. Brethren, we can't underestimate sin. You know, you know sometimes the enemy will whisper in our ears, it's just a little thing. And sometimes I hear people say, well, I know it's sin, you know, but I'm going to do it, and then I'm going to ask for forgiveness. Brethren, it doesn't matter how small the sin is, it will still cause a devastating effect in our life. We can't we can sin unknowingly. The devil can make you sin. Brethren, you can choose from today that you're not going to sin. We have to make a decision that we want to sin. And this is what the text is explaining here. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It, it, it says um, in verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? No, there's nothing wrong with God's law. God's law is perfect. The problem is it, with sin, that desire that we have within us. I, I'm not even talking about no sin nature. Because I don't believe we have sin nature. I believe we have a will. And it's our will that's driving us. It's that lust. It's the desire within us that's driving us. God didn't create none of us with a sin nature. If we get a sin nature after Adam's sin, 
It means that it wasn't put there by God. So if after Adam's sin, a sin nature go into human being, it means somebody else ha make an input into God's creation. So I don't believe in the sin nature. The sin nature was given to us by Saint Augustine. As I keep explaining, the black African theologian, Saint Augustine, he said, when a man and a woman have sexual relationship, uh, the sin nature from the man and the woman pass to the child. And that is how we get that sin nature. We don't have a sin nature. What we have is a will. We have the power to choose. You know, the, the word of God said, choose you this day whom you will serve. We can choose whether or not if we want to serve God or if we want to live a sinful lifestyle. Bless the Lord. What shall we say then? Is the Lord sin? God forbid. No, I had not known sin but by the law. What Paul is saying here, people didn't know sin. Sin wasn't identified until the law came forward. We studied a few weeks ago where it tells us that before the law, sin was not imputed. God did not put sin on the record of people back in the day before the law. Even though people was committing sin, God didn't impute it, he didn't record it because uh, the, the stop sign, there was no stop sign, there was no red light, there was no yield sign, none of these signs was up. And God being a, a just God, he did not uh, record sin on people's record. But what Paul is saying here, but by the law, I had, I had, I had not known sin. Let me read that over again. For what shall we say that is the, is the law sin God forbid? No, I had not known sin, but by the law. So when the law comes along, when the law came on the scene, the law caused sin to be revealed. The law, it makes people become aware, you know, that they are doing something wrong. But before that, the people were still sinning, but they didn't know that they were committing sin. Even though they were committing sin, they did not know because there was no law to identify sin. He said, for I have not known lust, except the law has said, ye shall not commit, commit. So what he's saying here, people did not know what lust was. Even though they were lusting, they were committing. The law was not there to identify it yet. So therefore, they didn't know what they were doing. Brethren, we, we have full sense. We have full knowledge of what we are doing today. God have mercy on those people before the law. But now we are in full knowledge. Our eyes is being opened. We are enlightened. So therefore we don't have no excuse. Every person will have to give God account for every idle thing that they've done in their life according to scripture. Now it tells us in verse 8. But sin take occasion by the commandment. What he's saying is sin take occasion. That's how sin operates Sin is going to take opportunity. Sin take uh, 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 occasion. In other words, sin take advantage. When, when the commandment came on the scene, sin take advantage because people's eyes was open. It's like you um, have your lawn and you put up a sign and you said, don't walk on the grass, don't walk on the lawn. You know, you put that sign up, think that you're going to be told people, people are going to you know, stay away from the, the, the walking on the lawn. You put up that sign, more people, it, according to what they're saying, more people will walk on it because they see the sign. And this, this, this is what happened here. Because the law came forth and it uh, caused the awareness of sin in, in, in humanity. Humanity was committing more sin than before. In other words, they were, they, they were doing it um, presumptuously. You know, because they want to, to break the laws of God. He said, uh, but sin take occasion by the commandment, work it in me all manner of lust. So, you know, before, it seems as though some things that people was not doing after the commandment came forth, and they know that it is wrong, they start doing these things that they're doing it more and more. For without the law, sin was dead. What he's saying here, before the law came, and when he said dead here, yeah, it means that sin was inactive. It don't mean dead, 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 no life. Sin was, it was like, it was like a sleeping dog. A dog that is sleeping. 
And after the law came, sin became awakened. And in verse 9, for so I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So what he's saying here, he was alive without the law. With, before the law, he was alive. But what, when the commandment came, sin revived. Yes, he was, humanity was alive before the law. But they didn't have the knowledge, they didn't have all of the knowledge of sin. I guess some of the, the knowledge that they have of sin is that manual that God placed within them. But they didn't have the written law. There was no stop sign, there was no um, red light, green light, nothing was up. So therefore, even though they was alive, they didn't really have the knowledge. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So sin revived, sin came alive because sin was like a sleeping dog. But when the commandment came, it became alive. And what Paul is saying that he died, he died here, I died, I guess represent that. He died in the sense that he could not provide salvation for himself. In other words, there was no way for him to solve the problem. And we have to understand the sin problem can't be solved by human beings. Humanity can't solve the sin problem. The sin problem can only be solved by God Almighty. And that's the reason why God sent Yeshua the Messiah. So that the sin problem can be solved. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the, 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 the sins of the world. Yeshua was the Lamb that God provided to take away the sins of the world. Praise the name of the Lord. In verse 10, as we come down to them, he said, And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. God's commandment, all of the commandments that God gave, God gave them so that humanity could have life. But humanity turned it, they turned it around, they used it in a wrong way. God gave, the commandment was supposed to give life. And we have to understand, yes, that is, that is the design that God designed the commandment for. The commandment showed people what sin was. But the commandment didn't have the ability to prevent people from sinning. The commandment, God's commandment, it was a stop sign. It was to tell people to stop. It's a red light. But when you're driving on the road and you see a red light, you see a stop sign. You don't have to obey it. You know, you don't have to obey a stop sign yet. You could, you could just go right through stop sign. People go through stop sign, kill other people. A few years ago, I, I was driving and I, you know, uh, coming up on um, Islington, it was early in the morning, I didn't see a stop sign. And I go through it. You know, it's, uh, by the grace of God, nobody was crossing, there was no vehicle, but I paid for it because there was a, there was a red light camera there. So I had to pay for it. The thing is, with stop sign, People could choose whether to stop or whether to go through. And the stop sign can make you stop. And the same thing when the law is concerned. The law, the commandment that God gave to us can make us obey. He don't have the power to make us obey. And that's the reason why God, He provided Yeshua the Messiah. He provided grace. The, the scripture tells us for the grace of God that bringeth forth salvation have appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying all ungodliness and all worldly lusts, so that we can live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. The law didn't have the power to prevent us from sin. But you know what prevented us from sinning? You know why we're not practicing sin? Are you living above sin, by the way? Are you going without living above sin? Brethren, yes, we can live without sinning. We don't have to sin. Why? Because God give us grace. The grace of God, God give us his grace so we don't have to sin. The grace of God brings forth salvation and is teaching, is teaching us how to deny. God's grace is showing us how we can deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And is showing us how we can live in this present sinful world. Glory be to God, we can live above sin in this sinful world because God has given us his grace. Praise the name of the Lord. Bless the Lord. And it says, verse 11. I think that's what I'm going to stop for today. For sin take occasion by commandment. Deceive me. 
and by its slow way. So what he's saying here is sin, use the commandment, abuse the commandment. Sin take advantage of God's commandment. Because the stop sign was out. Sin in us, our desire, and I'm not talking about no sinful nature. Our, our will, power within us, our uh, desire within us for evil. Sin used that desire to break God's commandment. And this is what Paul is saying here. Because uh, the, the stop sign was up, the yield sign was up, the green light was up, and the red light was up, sin used those um, as an occasion to break God's commandment. And what he said is that it deceive us. That is what sin is doing, deceiving us. It's like when we look back into Genesis and you see the story about Adam and Eve. God told them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everybody read that? And oh, the snake, who it said is the devil, came along and said, you're, you're not doing that because the woman, when he come and he explained to her, at least that's what the text said, he said to the woman, you're not going to show me die. In the day that you eat of this fruit, you're not going to die, but your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be like God. That was where the deception is. And the text said that the enemy beguiled or deceived Adam and Eve. Well, the text said Eve, but Adam was deceived also. Because he said Adam wasn't deceived, but he went into it with his eyes fully open. He knew what he was doing. So the enemy, one of the main weapons that the devil is using is deception. And brethren, that is the reason why we have to examine the word of God for ourselves. We can't, we can't be deceived. Be not deceived. The word tells us, God is not mocked. What sort of man so that shall he also read? Don't allow nobody to deceive you. When you are listening to somebody, it doesn't matter if it's your favorite teacher. You have to check what your teacher, your favorite teacher is saying with what the word of God is saying. Everybody have a Bible. And that's the reason why God is going to hold all of us accountable. Do you know back in the early time, most people didn't have Bibles. Bibles were very, very precious. It was very expensive. It was in the temple. When I was growing up, most people didn't have a Bible. In the Roman Catholic Church, they saw the Bible and they chained it down on the pulpit because they don't want anybody to steal it. But now, everybody has Bibles. You know, by the way, if you want Bibles, you can go by the um, Salvation Army. Salvation Army. When Bibles come in, you go there and you just take it and you go by the counter and say, this is the Bible, I'm taking it for free. They give you for free. So everybody could have a Bible and they can see for themselves, you know, what the text of Scripture is saying. We have to be like the Bereans. Paul talked about the Bereans. When Paul, the Apostle Paul, theologian, uh, gets, you know, um, philosopher, they didn't trust him because of his title. What they did, when he speaks to them, they take it and they go home and they're going to cross-reference and see if what the Apostle Paul said to them was matching up to Scripture. This is what we are to do, brethren, so that we will not be deceived because there's a lot of deception in the body of Christ. You know, we are looking at the book of Jude and Jude is going to warn us, tell us about the deception, tell us about those men who crept in warm themselves in unaware and they were deceiving people so brethren let us open up our eyes and let us look at what the text of scripture is saying so that we can live a life that is pleasing in the sight of the lord the lord bless us and we want to ask the musicians to come back bless the lord most like i want to thank you for who you are god we want to thank you for the law i want to thank you lord for the moral laws that you have given to us and Father God, we have to keep the moral laws. Father, you're going, to keep, you're going to bring us into judgment. You're going to bring us to accountability when we break these moral laws. Help us to know, oh God, freedom from the law does not mean freedom to break God's law. It means that we are not under the judgment, under the punishment of the law. Father God, give us the grace and the strength so that in this time that we are living in, we can live a holy life, a life that is devoted and consecrated and dedicated to you. Help us, O oh God, so that we can run the race that is set before us, looking on to Yeshua. 
the author and the finish of our faith. We ask these blessings in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God.